Staten Island, New York, November 12th, 2012. In the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy, a team of about eight to 10 individuals from Enola First Church of God made their way to Staten Island and under the direction of the Mennonite Disaster Service, we went to work in a small way to help those individuals there that were in need. And the jobs that we were assigned to do had to deal with what we call mucking out houses. That means going in there and taking out wet drywall, wet insulation, mud, and all kinds of slop and goop. It was disgusting. Well, there was one particular job where someone needed to crawl into the side of a house um, under the crawl space and tear wet, stinky, young, yucky uh, insulation off of the floor joists. Um, guess who got assigned to do that job? You're looking at them, you got it right. And there I was laying flat on my back, looking up at these floor joists, tearing out the wet, yucky, goopy, disgusting insulation, putting it in a pile, and all of a sudden, unbidden, out of the blue, I looked at the pile of insulation that I had created, and this rat-like looking creature shot out, came right beside me, jumped up on my thigh, ran across my chest, and went past my face. How did I respond to this phenomenon? Well, I did like any other grown man would do. I screamed like a five-year-old little kid. And by the way, my screaming prompted another grown man to scream like a little kid. I won't tell you who he is, but his initials are Barry Wolf. <laughs> oh, he's going to be so mad if he's here at the 1030 service and I mention his initials like that. Man. Well, I soon found out that this rat-like creature was not a rat. It was actually a cat. Lovely. But after that phenomenon, man, did I ever have a mess. I was so wet, so dirty, so muddy. My pants, my shirt, everything was soiled due to the mud and the slop and the glop, and maybe for another reason. And so I decided I need to do something about this. Fortunately, there was a relief center set up just down the street in a school, and I know it was for the residents there that had needs. A lot of people sent in clothes and different things that they may need. But I walked in and I said, I'm not from here. I'm not a resident of Staten Island, New York. I said, but can I please have a set of dry clothes? They said, absolutely. So I took a brand new, well, used pair of jeans and a shirt. And I went into a public restroom, put them on. But before I did that, you know what I did first? Those yucky muddy, stinky, smelly, wet clothes, I took them off and I threw them away. Done with them. Then I put the dry clothes on. Where can we go with that today? Well, as you know, through our study of Colossians, this is a letter the Apostle Paul wrote to these ancient Christians and by extension to us today to remind them that we are rooted and built up in Jesus Christ. And that's fantastic news because there's a lot of stuff out there we call winds of false doctrine from false teachers that would seek to knock us down. But we're rooted. And being rooted, it's a really good idea uh, to do our part as possible to strengthen those roots. And that's what we're looking at in this part of the series. Last Sunday, if you were here, you recall we said we need to Look up, look to Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father. For many reasons, that strengthens our root. Today, what we're going to talk about is having the discipline to get rid of the old self, or I wish I would have entitled it or made the theme, get rid of the earthly things associated with the old self. In other words, take that off and throw it away. And that's what we'll be focusing on from Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. We invite you to turn in your own Bibles to Colossians 3, 5 through 9. Or you may want to pull it up on your phone on a Bible app. Or you can use our pew Bibles where this passage can be found on page 1169. Colossians 3, 5 through 9. 
Paul tells the Colossians and by us, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. And we'll stop there for today. So we're going to give you a note by looking right here in the middle of the passage, starting not at the beginning, but at verse 7, please. Here's a note. The instructions given in this passage are for Christians rooted in Christ. Now, the reason I said this is because if you look at some of these things that Paul is saying, you got to get rid of these. Sexual immorality, covetousness, anger, slander, obscene talk, blah, blah, blah. You might be thinking, well, okay, how can non-Christians that are a part of this hookup and friends with benefits culture have the discipline to change and not participate in sexual immorality anymore. I mean, how is it possible are Hamas terrorists going to just one day simply say, you know what, let's start being kind to the Jewish people and give up anger and wrath and these sort of things. And what about obscene talk? Are a bunch of rough and tough guys that are getting smashed down at the bar, are they going to stop automatically using four-letter words that you're not supposed to say on TV, but I think they do these days. And the question is, you know, how is it that these people are just going to be able to turn it off because Paul says so? Well, I got news for you. They're not going to just turn it off. And the reason is this letter is not for them. This is not instruction for unregenerate unbelievers. They're not going to stop. But this instruction is for us, not for the unbelievers. Why is it not for unbelievers? Because they're not rooted or built up in Christ. They are lost. Unfortunately, they are lost. Hey, I've had people come up to me and they get talking and they're cussing and carrying on. Obviously, they're not Christians, but then there have been Christians there, followers of Jesus, who see this phenomenon. Look at that guy talking that way in front of the preacher. And then they come up to me afterwards and they say, weren't you shocked that they talked that way in front of you? My answer is, no, I'm not shocked. I expect lost, unregenerate people to act like lost, unregenerated people. I mean, what, are you, what else are you going to say? Well, that's just how it is. Hey, I'm not at all surprised when my dog walks up to me and says, whoop. And you know why? Because that's what dogs do. I expect my dog to act like a dog. I expect a non-believer to act like a non-believer. So these instructions you see of getting rid of the things that are earthly associated with the old self, they are not for non-believers. They are for followers of Jesus, those who have been born again. Now, why is that? Well, these instructions help us who are already rooted to strengthen those roots. Well, let me show it to you this way. Many times I've shown this diagram before. I think it's very helpful. For the non-believer, their life is like what you see on the left. This is how they exist. Their flesh, represented by the gray matter there, is their sinful nature produces sinful desires their old inner nature is also sinful. You have the gray matter there. And in the mind where they make decisions, guess what they're going to decide to do? To follow the flesh, the old nature. All of it, the flesh, the inner nature, and the mind, they're all in cahoots with this gray matter like a bunch of crooks. But then when you come to faith in Jesus, there's a change. The Holy Spirit now lives in you. 
Now, in your mind, each and every day, you and I have to decide, are we going to listen to the flesh? Because we still live in these fleshly bodies. But now we have the Holy Spirit guiding us and saying, no, there's a better way. And so strengthening our roots basically is strengthening ourselves and through the power of God's Spirit, strengthening ourselves so that in our minds, more and more, we listen to the Holy Spirit and not to the flesh. Now, if what I said about the non-believers sounded like bad news for you, you're thinking, well, what hope is there for those that are not converted? The answer is there is none until or unless they come to faith in Jesus. Then they're one of us. Then they have the Holy Spirit. Then these instructions are for them. Some of you may be wondering, well, these instructions that Paul gives here, you know, to put this away, uh, put to death this, all these instructions, why do we need them if we have the Holy Spirit? It's because the Holy Spirit will do his part to encourage us, to remind us of the right things, to equip us. But we need in our minds and our free will to continue to follow the Holy Spirit. That's why these instructions are so important. That's our part of what goes on in the mind. So having said that, what are the instructions? Well, the first instruction in verses five to six is to put to death what is earthly. You will notice that he says there in verse 5, put to death therefore what is earthly. Anytime you see the word therefore, you should ask, what is it therefore? It is there because it connects to the previous verses, verses 1 through 4, where Paul said again, keep your minds fixed on Jesus. Look to Jesus. Put your mind on Jesus who is seated at the right hand of God. That's what we should be doing, looking up to him. And if we are looking up to him, what that means is there are some things in our lives down here that we need to get rid of, that we need to put to death. Now, someone might think this, and they might say, but I thought when I became a Christian that the body of sin was crucified to bring about nothing. In fact, that's a verse in Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. It says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. If the body of sin is brought to nothing, why is it that we still struggle and we need these instructions? Well, let's go back to the diagram again. Here is what has been brought to nothing. The body of sin, that diagram, that person you used to be where the flesh, the mind, and the inner nature are all together, working together like a bunch of crooks, and it's all about sin. But when you come to know Jesus, you're a new person. That's done away with who you were. But even still, again, as we said, as a believer, there is a struggle. Yes, we can listen to the Holy Spirit, and hopefully we do, but many times we fail, and in our minds we listen to the flesh. That's why the instructions are there. The instructions are put to death these things. What do we mean by put to death? The phrase in the original text, in the original language, means to deprive of power or to destroy the strength of something. Okay. And if you're thinking, well, how do you do that? If in my life there's something that I really am struggling with, how do I deprive it of power? How do I destroy its strength? How do I put it to death? Well, the one thing that we can remember to do is to, whatever it is, don't feed it. You may have heard the old ancient Cherokee legend about a grandfather who was talking to his grandson. And he was talking about the fact how you can have inner struggles inside of your mind, inside of your soul, inner conflicts. And um, he, the grandson asked, uh, well, the grandfather said those, those inner conflicts are like two wolves that are fighting after one another. And so the grandson says, well, which wolf is going to win? And the grandfather said, whichever one you feed. So the point is, don't feed these things, and it will put them to death. Another thing we can do is to use discipline. Remember that diagram where it shows the mind? In our minds, we need to resolve that we are going to put these things to death. It's a discipline. Discipline is something that you kind of have to make yourself do. Discipline, like getting up 
out of bed early and going to the gym, that's not something that most people just naturally do. It's something that you must discipline yourself to do. How about it? And another thing that we can do is something recommended by Jesus, that if there's something outside of us causing those earthly things inside of us to rear their ugly heads, just get rid of those outside things. Jesus put this in a very, very stark way in Matthew chapter 5, verses 19 to 20. This is what he says. He says the following. If your right eye causes you to sin, get this, tear it out and throw it away. Yikes. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now, we know that Jesus is using this as a metaphor. He's not literally telling people to gouge out and chop off body parts. It's a metaphor that basically says, if there's something outside of you that is causing the earthly parts in you to sin and to disobey God, whatever that outside thing is, just, just get rid of it. Get rid of that thing. And that will really help for you to put to death those earthly things inside of you. So what are these earthly things that we are to put to death? Well, Paul names them. Why does he name them? Because naming things has power in it. One Bible commentator in the book of Colossians says this. It is far easier to drift into a sin which one does not know by name than consciously to choose one whose very title should be repugnant to a Christian. In other words, if you name it, then you really know what it is, and you can focus on that and say, that needs to go. So what are these things? Well, he mentions several on the list here. Um, he mentions sexual immorality. Again, going back to the original languages, that's illicit sexual relations with other people. Impurity, the second one, refers to lustful, wasteful living. Although it's not mentioned in Luke 15, I think it describes very well the story of the prodigal son. Many of you remember that story, how he wasted and squandered all of what he received from his father in a very sinful way. Passion, depraved passion, is what is being referred to there. Evil desire, desiring what is forbidden or lust, and covetousness having a greedy desire to have more and to be jealous of what others have. This one is equated, Paul says, with idolatry. And why is that? Because those greedy desires that we may have, they can come to the point where they take our focus off of God and they take the place of God. We want that thing more than we do God. And the reason... Paul and Jesus and the whole of Scripture takes these matters so seriously is because of what one writer said about, frankly, in history from Adolf Hitler. I, I thought this was an interesting illustration. Listen to what this writer said. It would have been unthinkable for the Allied leaders to let Adolf Hitler surrender and then reinstate him as dictator of his country. He had to be eliminated. So don't take halfway measures with dishonesty, lack of self-control, or sexual impurity. Instead, deal radically with your sinful tendencies. In other words, it can't be compromised with, it can't be calmed down. It's got to go. So if we're going to do our part to strengthen our roots, remember there are earthly things in us that we need to get rid of, uh, to put to death, to throw them away. Second instruction from verses 8 through 9. The second instructions are put away these things. Well, this is pretty much the same thing that we looked at, just put a different way. Except now he says, put these away. What, what does he mean to put them away? To put away is the uh, English translation of what's in the original language. To put off or to disavow, to renounce. Say, not going there. What kinds of things does he say in this case? need to be put away. Well, it's a little bit different of a list, but we see these are earthly things as well. Anger, and it's so interesting, in the uh, original language, we don't catch this, but 
the ancient people would have heard the word used and would have thought of something stirring, internal motion. Isn't that interesting? We say that as well, that somebody's getting mad, there's something stirring in them. The ancient people thought of anger as something it was starting to stir. Here it goes, it's stirring up. Then it leads to wrath. Wrath is where it really boils up. And then the result of wrath, anger and wrath that is, first could be malice. That's the desire to injure or harm someone else who is the object of your anger. And slander, that's where you use speech who is injurious to someone, especially someone with a good reputation. Obscene talk, well, we know what that is. And lying to one another, that also needs no explanation. And Paul makes it very clear there in these verses, remember that we have put off the old self. These things also are part of that old self. Remember again, those things to which we have been saved from, part of the old nature, we have a brand new nature now in Jesus Christ. So therefore, those things that are part of the old nature, just disavow them. We don't need that, we're not going there. Now, do you remember the story I opened this message with? I'm sure you remember the part how I screamed like a little kid at that rat-like cat, yeah, of course. Um, but do you remember how I had to take off all of those muddy, dirty, disgusting clothes that same day and get rid of them? Well, that's not the last time I've had to throw away clothes. Since that time, I've had shirts that I've spilled ink on or that I've gotten dirt on or grease, oh my goodness, or coffee, or I've had pants that have gotten caked with different things, maybe like cement or tar, or they have holes worn in them. And so I've had to throw them away. Why am I telling you this? Not that you need information about my wardrobe or the lack thereof, but the point is this, the process of taking off and throwing away dirty, rotten clothes is not a one-time deal for any of us. I'm sure that many of you in the last year have had to throw things away because they've gotten stained or tabbed or had grease on them or whatever. That's a very good illustration for what this discipline is like. Yes, Jesus comes in and changes your life. The Holy Spirit comes into you. But in your mind, daily, we have to decide, am I gonna to listen to the Holy Spirit or to this flesh in which I still live? Well, to strengthen our roots in Christ, this is the discipline. It's a process of getting rid of those things associated with the old self, putting them to death, throwing them away, disavowing them. It's a spiritual discipline. The Holy Spirit will do his part, so let us resolve to continually doing our part. That will help to strengthen our roots in Christ. So let's get out there and each and every day take that off and throw it away. Amen.